Hello and welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark. I am incredibly honored to be joined today by writer and game designer Robin Laws. Robin, welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing very well. Robin and I uh, met at the Cthulhu Con in Portland in 2015, uh, where we were both in attendance. Uh, he was there talking about game designing. Uh, I think uh, you were there with uh, Ken Height uh, doing a live Ken and Robin talk about stuff. Uh, from your podcast, and I was there, Ask Lovecrafting, as usual. And uh, I've, I talked about this a bit when I had uh, Ken on, but uh, Ro Robin was very sort of instrumental in helping me finally feel like a grown-up <laughs> at these things. Uh, Robin very kindly, uh, uh, as I was sort of kind of moping around in a uh, courtyard or uh, uh, the sort of a lobby, shouted, hey, Lovecraft, come have dinner with us. And it was... <laughs> well, when you have an opportunity very, to, to, to use those words, you've got to use them. Precisely. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderfully casual invitation, but it sort of was the first time I was like, oh, hold up. I, I'm not some, I'm not, you know, three raccoons in a trench coat that somehow snuck into uh, this world. Like, I, 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 I actually... If you were here. three raccoons in a trench coat, I still would have invited you. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, and that was a uh, that was a really special moment, and I don't know if I ever got a chance to sort of thank you in person for that, but uh, I thank you because that was uh, I don't know that was that was uh, I've written I've written about that in the past, just kind of how that was a, an interesting. It was when I stopped sort of apologizing for for the art that I do, uh, which is strange art, I admit, but it's art I don't feel like I need to apologize for anymore. Well, if you're ever part of a clan, uh, as as it being H. P. Lovecraft, being it. A Cthulhu convention is is where you're part of the clan. So <laughs> yeah, if you don't if belong you there, if you can't find people <laughs> to hang out for dinner there. Where are you going to do that? Um, but Rob and I would continue to run into each other because we both lived in Toronto, and Toronto, despite being a city of like a million, million and a half people, has certain small town qualities, and that you do tend to kind of run into the people you know out by the you know. Chinese produce store or, uh, you know, just roaming around the annex or places like that. So yeah, Robin and I would sort of keep bumping into each other, which uh, just sort of added to the, the and, fun and nature. And you invited me to come and see your, your one-man show at the Fringe. That's right, that's right. You, and you uh, you came to that and I wasn't sure, at that point we had, um, we had a few, we had had a few conversations, but I remember you sort of came to that sort of arms crossed, you know, browse down and like oh no is he hating this or is he just have sort of like <laughs> my resting enjoyment face because that's how i watch theater yes. like i watch theater like this is very good and i'm enjoying it very much you gotta you gotta have somewhere to put your arms where, where like <laughs> that. That, that'd be weird <laughs> just just you yeah. know the glamour glamour pose <laughs> no and that was a lot of fun but of course i had known about robin's work uh even if uh i, I hadn't ever put his name or face to it um, because being a weirdo who liked uh, card games and board games and role playing games, I was aware of stuff like uh, Over the Edge, <laughs> for instance. Mostly mostly I knew Over the Edge because of the Illuminati card referencing Over the Edge that was so bizarre that I made me had to look that up. Well, that's a cross promotion for you. First, and, yeah. and successful cross promotion was that was that one of your earliest works that you that you oh, were yeah. involved so the, with? The first things I worked on in the in the early nineties, like ninety two, ninety three, uh, were uh, my uh, additional material that I added to Jonathan Tweet's Over the Edge game. So I wrote some setting material for it before it was supposed to be a book. Even um, we struck up a correspondence through uh, a fanzine and uh, an APA, which. Uh, Love, Lovecraft uh, fans will, I don't have to explain what APA is to only people list watching uh, Think About Lovecraft. Um, and so we were both involved in this role-playing APA called Alarms and Excursions, and we struck up a correspondence outside of that. And uh, he talked about uh, this game that he uh, had written in order to do something that could never be published, so it would just be pure art. And uh, it was inspired in part by an article that I'd written in Alarms and Excursions about William S. Burroughs uh, inspired role-playing. And so because of that, uh, he talked a bit more uh, in a postal correspondence back in the olden days when people mailed physical bits of paper to each other in order to communicate. And uh, instead of doing my uh, writing on my uh, writing days that I had off from work, uh, for a while I was just coming up with cool uh, setting ideas for his uh, world of Alamara or his place of Alamara. And so when John Nephew of Atlas decided uh, you know, the, the idea that a game that could not be published was a, a red flag to the bull that was going up here and he decided to publish it. 
And uh, then the stuff that I'd written just to send to Jonathan wound up being in that first book. So it is Jonathan's thing, I got to stress, to which I added some stuff uh, on the margins. Um, one funny thing about that was that uh, I had used uh, the, the F-bomb uh, casually in the description, and there was a big back and forth as to whether a role-playing game could possibly be published that had the word fuck in it. And my point of view was, no, take it out, man. It's, I didn't intend that to be published. That, that's inconceivable that a role-playing game could ever have a four-letter word in it. And so it was taken out. Uh, later supplements did then uh, uh, have swears sneak into them. Uh, but it's sort of a funny uh, sort of window into where uh, role-playing games were at, uh, as a medium in the, in the 90s. So that was the one thing. The other thing was uh, uh, The Madlands uh, was published as GURPS Fantasy II, and this was a uh, sort of fantasy horror setting in which you are uh, members of a, uh, a traditional society without significant technology living in the worst place in the fantasy world where they were so close to the gods that the gods were uh, basically just horrific monsters and everything uh, uh, and they generated other horrific monsters and it was a sort of game of uh, survival in this hostile fantasy world which was not a power fantasy uh, at all and this was uh, had, was something that I'd written up I ran a campaign of this uh, and wrote up uh, descriptions of it for alarms and excursions and then one day out of the blue I got a writer's packet from Steve Jackson game saying would you like to turn this into a source book um, and uh, it, it's sort of an interesting experiment because, in a way, it's sort of a, a, a setting that is uh, the thing that you would least associate with GURPS because it is so uh, completely weird. And especially at that time, they've certainly done other weird things later. Um, and so those two things came out at roughly the same time. And I kind of quickly uh, developed a reputation for being uh, good and on time. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, all the industry folks uh, hung out on an, uh, a, a secret industry board on uh, AOL on America Online. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, word got around through uh, folks on there that I was available to do stuff, and I was able to uh, uh, quit my, uh, my day job and become a freelance writer, which I've been ever since in games and, and game-adjacent uh, projects. Now, did the the writing lead into gaming, or had you been gaming and playing GURPS and things like that, and sort of going into the game uh, writing world from there? Um, I I uh, had been a gaming hobbyist uh, since uh, late grade school, uh, but it, and had always wanted to be a writer. But I always thought of myself perhaps being a playwright, and I'd never thought of um, gaming as an outlet for writing until these you know I, I fell backwards into it. Um, the, that original game actually was not run as a GURPS game. Uh, don't ever ask me to run GURPS, people. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was turned into a, a GURPS project. So that's got to be interesting to sort of have a completely different game system applied to your setting or your writing. Uh, yes. Uh, the the uh, rule set that I actually used for it was a really early precursor of what eventually became HeroQuest, the very, very story-oriented oriented, uh, uh, engine for uh, Glorantha. And so uh, turning it into a GURPS thing was, in a way, turning it into a diametrically opposed game system. Uh, and uh, But also sort of suitable, though, because uh, GURPS handles low-tech really well. And uh, uh, But, uh, you know, it, it, it would be a completely different set of assumptions uh, to play that game in in that rule setting than in the one I actually ran it in. Was there a, was there a sort of a cultural difference uh, in that era surrounding kind of the intersection of like settings and rules? Was there sort of this idea that like, well, any setting can really go anywhere, and you're just sort of you know swapping out widgets here? Because I know now you know. We... But that's always been the perennial argument. I don't think it's changed over the years. I think the thing that was uh, particular about GURPS was just they were at that time in the setting and source book business. That unlike most games, uh, the whole idea of GURPS, uh, even more so than Champions, is that this is an engine that you uh, keep checking out different settings for. And uh, so therefore they needed, uh, you know, once they ran out of all the, the regular sensible genres, they needed to, you know, occasionally reach out uh, to, to people and, uh, 
uh, you know, tapped them to do uh, peculiar things like uh, like Madlands, and and also was a time when, you know, uh, I think Steve just uh, at that time the uh, there were few enough game companies that Lee Gold of Alarms and Excursions just sent a copy to all the different game companies, and I think Steve just looked at it and went, hmm, "This looks like a thing. Let's see if it's a thing." And so there's a sense of sort of experimentalism around uh, what you could. Uh, do with GURPS. So in a way, it's sort of a, a, a demonstration of the versatility of, of that concept. And and were you having to like figure out all the different charts and whatnot and how to like, you know, smash that in? Or was there some like hapless editor who was who was doing the kind of mechanical work? Um, I I did make a stab at, at doing the, the GURPS uh, rules parts of it. And sometimes uh, Steve was like, we have GURPS insanity rules. Use those instead this thing. Um, but uh, uh, so it, it was the usual process where you know I made my best stab, and then uh, the developer, in that case, would was Steve, uh, and, and and he would know how to fix it. If you want to, uh, we have do, a we, have Steve. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we've got an interesting question here uh, uh, in the audience. Crash was curious how mechanical rule sets affect the kind of stories that get told within systems. Uh, which seems like a big, <laughs> a big well, question. But uh, really given, just, given you know. How, a huge example of that comes to mind now with Glorantha, which now has three different rule systems, uh, one of which was designed by me. I'm now writing a couple of giant supplements for one of the other systems, the main, the original one, RingQuest, which is still by far the most popular one. And there's also 13th Age in Glorantha. And so uh, the supplement I'm uh, writing is the Big Rubble. So it's a revisit to a sort of classic kind of sandboxy ruins slash dungeon environment. Um, and the behavior of the characters is would be very different in all of the systems. And so I'm currently running a, a game of it with RuneQuest, even though obviously if I was to pick the system I was running, I would pick the one that thinks like I do, the one that I designed. Um, and so uh, RuneQuest is notoriously punishing, for example, in, in its combat. And, and also very detailed. Uh, so uh, it really makes a lot to do with, say, hit locations and individual bits of armor on hit locations. And you know, very often the outcome of a fight is your limb gets wrecked. There's a lot of limb wrecking in, uh, <laughs> in Green Quest. If the, uh, whereas in the more narrative focused Hero Quest game, if we were had the same characters in the same environment, nobody's limbs would be getting wrecked. There wouldn't have been a big plot development where the characters had to go across the ruins in order to replace a piece of leg armor. Um, and the uh, dangerousness of the combat would not nearly be so much. And that would affect all of their decisions. So uh, uh, several weeks ago, the uh, group spent a lot of time deciding to attack this castle full of undead. And then the uh, sentinels on the parapet of the castle shot one round of arrows at them, and they went, oh, wait, arrows are very dangerous. <laughs> Let's run away. In 13th Age, you would just go, well, of course we're going to charge through those arrow, uh, arrows. It's the whole point of uh, a, an F20 game like uh, 13th Age is to uh, have fun uh, kicking the asses of uh, various creatures. And so, of course, you know, we expect to survive a round full of arrows, and we're just going to go and kill everybody in, in the rubble, probably in a couple of weeks, we'll just clear the whole place out. And so uh, a, a hero quest version would very quickly turn into sort of drama and myth. Uh, Rune quest is sort of scrabbling around for every possible uh, advantage and while constantly being in peril and anything can kill you at any time with a lucky shot to the head. And, you know, 13th age would be uh, rootin' tootin' fightin' smashing. And so the, uh, storyline is very different and would be very different depending on which uh, rule set you used, even with the same set of characters in the same world in the same environment. Now, do you do you find that that sort of maps onto the whole kind of trichotomy of gamist, narrativist, simulationist, or do you find that more kind of too reductive? Uh, I, I do not find that taxonomy useful. Yeah. Um, for me, as a, as a game designer, as soon as someone tries to set up a system for this is how games are, my immediate response is, well, how do I mess with that? How do I divide <laughs> those expectations? Um, and uh, you know, the person who designed them, of course, is a taxonomist in his real life. So it's 
not a surprise that, that, that it exists in that way. But uh, I think for a uh, game designer, you want to focus less on abstract principles like that and more on what is the emotional experience uh, and what is the flavor of the uh, game experience that I'm having? What is the core activity? How do I realize that? How do I make something that feels different than other games? Not so, how do I make something that fits into a pretty range category? <clears throat> and so given that, do you tend to approach things from a kind of like, all right, setting and, you know, things that are being evocative? All right, I want to create Hong Kong action, you know, feeling. Therefore, these are the rules that work for it. Or, oh, this is an interesting rule. What would this work well to kind of evoke? Oh, this reminds me of Hong Kong action movies. Uh, it's definitely A. It's, it's about... Uh, what is the experience? What is the world? What are the feelings? Uh, what, what are we emulating? If we're emulating something from another medium, and then how to realize that? That rules are only, uh, it, it's like you know camera lenses, right? You don't go, well, I would like to create a story where uh, a 30 millimeter lens is used throughout, or uh, you know, I wanna make sure there's, there's something with a lot of back projection that that's not how you think of things. It's like, oh, well, I, I want to do a, a, a car scene and I want it to feel somewhat surreal. So therefore, I only use back projection. It, that, that's the order of thinking uh, to creating uh, stories because, of course, uh, whether you like it or not, and some people aren't so comfortable with it, uh, role playing became a narrative form as soon as uh, you know, the guy with the hat that Gary and, and uh, Dave were uh, playing with when they raided D&D, &D, as soon as he had a second adventure, uh, no matter how rudimentary it was, uh, they were t telling a story that had a narrative form. And uh, since my own background was in uh, playwriting and criticism and film, uh, what I thought I could bring uh, to the table was to look at how other narrative forms work and see what we're not yet doing in role playing and try to find the simplest possible rule structures in order to uh, make that happen at the gaming table. Uh, I brought up the Hong Kong action because of course Feng Shui is one of, uh, you know, I was about to say it's actually two of your great successes because it's, it's gone now through two different iterations. Um, how did that come about? Uh, in the mid eighties, uh, in 86 at the Toronto International Film Festival, which I've gone to uh, every year since the mid 80s, um, a film programmer named David Overby programmed a series called Asian Horizons, uh, which really uh, helped lead the wave of uh, sort of appreciation of contemporary Asian cinema uh, in, uh, in North America and, and the rest of the festival circuit. And he made the then radical decision to program a bunch of uh, commercial Hong Kong movies, uh, which, uh, and that happened to be sort of the beginning of the flowering of that uh, amazing uh, period of Hong Kong cinema, which goes way beyond action movies, but of which action movies were uh, a big part. And so uh, that year he programmed A Better Tomorrow and uh, Savior the Soul. And over uh, several years afterwards, uh, I became aware through that initially, and then through the uh, uh, film fan community uh, of this whole wave of Hong Kong cinema and watching the fights and how much, how uh, innovative the presentation was and how exciting they were and how much more thrilling they were than uh, what was then being done in Hollywood. I also thought, well, how could you possibly do this in a role playing game context? How like the uh, you would have to completely reorient it the, the way that we do fights and role-playing where it's very tactical and the GM is assumed to be in complete control of the environment. And, you know, only if the GM decided in advance that there's a set of skis in, in the warehouse, is there a set of skis? And you certainly can never just pick up a set of skis and say, well, I, you know, I, I ignore my main weapon that I always use. I just grab the skis and I whack the guy with the skis. That was unthinkable at the time. Uh, and so one of the main things that, that Feng Shui originally did was said, well, you know what? If it's within reason and within the, the world of uh, these uh, wild, exciting action movies, the world of reason is very big, uh, you, you can describe things in the room and describe yourself doing cool things and not being penalized for them. And so uh, that 
was sort of the, the idea that, I mean, it's, it seems completely anodyne now to say, oh yeah, you can describe minor things in the environment if the GM approves them. But at the time, it was a big revolution, uh, revelation and a lot of other people then took that very simple idea and translated it into other games. So uh, that's how they played Star Wars or um, or D and D, for example. And then when you got to return to this property again, what did you find? You know, how did you find the culture had changed or or stayed the same? Kind of what was that process like? Well, definitely, there it was no longer necessary to explain to people who. John Woo was, or uh, <laughs> you know, uh, who Jackie Chan was, that uh, the uh, awareness of Hong Kong cinema filtered out not just through uh, role playing, but in a much broader sense through uh, general film culture. And so uh, the, uh, and those were very, um, the original Feng Shui came out during the VHS era. So uh, it was very hard to find things at the time. And then of course the flowering of film collecting under the DVD era made things a lot easier. And now uh, streaming has made all of these films even more accessible than they ever were. Like you can see all sorts of great films uh, as they come out essentially on Netflix. And uh, the uh, revolution in uh, South Korean cinema has happened since then as well. And so uh, there's a, a ton of great uh, uh, Korean action movies and genre movies that you can uh, check out today. So the the uh, awareness of these films and their ability to propagate to people is, uh, you know, uh, an order of magnitude more than it was uh, back in VHS times. <coughs> if a, a publishing company sort of came to you with, you know, a decent enough size check and said, all right, what's the next profitable gaming cinema, you know, tradition we should be like going into, what would you you uh where where, where you know, how would you spend their well, money where would you go uh, those don't fall off trees um so <laughs> there was a rare instance of my you know being lucky enough to see something that was coming um uh, certainly uh you know people can uh traditionally what publishers do is they come to me and say i would like something that does x and then i you know come up with a way to do x so that's for example where uh, the gumshoe system comes from uh, simon rogers who uh, was then the sole publisher of uh, Pelgrane Publishing. Uh, we'd worked together on Dying Earth, and he came and said, well, can you come up with something that solves the problem in uh, mystery gaming where you roll to get information, you fail, and then you're kind of stuck? And so Gumshoe says, well, don't do that. And, and then builds on that, because once you do that, that has all sorts of other ramifications for how you create mystery scenarios, and you can structure them in a much uh, richer, more interesting way that, where it becomes about uh, figuring out what the information means rather than just, did you actually find the book that tells you to go to the old mill um, and uh, then something happens at the old mill. Um, and so, uh, and then uh, that's been recapitulated over the years at Pelgrane where uh, they said, well, uh, sometimes I'll say, do you want a space opera game? And then I'll pitch the Mash and Stars or uh, more often they'll say, we would like a game that does X. So uh, most recently the Yellow King role-playing game uh, uh, Kat Tobin and Simon Rogers came to me and said, this uh, collection that you've written of uh, Robert Chambers inspired uh, short fiction, we would love you to turn that into a role playing game. And so the, the anthology was uh, New Tales of the Yellow Sign, and then uh, the uh, very ambitious design of the, role play, uh, the Yellow King role playing game was based on the uh, question of how do I turn this book of stories into an interesting role-playing game that doesn't just duplicate the way that the Yellow King is traditionally handled in uh, Cthulhu stuff. Well, that's because that's something I find really fascinating as someone who's, you know, kind of got dropped into the Lovecraft world was realizing, oh, there's all this yellow sign, all this Hester. I guess this is just one of Lovecraft's properties. And you realize, no, 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 no. This is this completely other different guy, Robert Chambers, yeah. who's mostly doing like kind of romance and mysteries and then wrote this collection of short stories, most of which actually aren't about weird, creepy yellow signs, but are mostly about like Parisians sleeping with each other and doing art. Well, they're, they're, they're sleeping with each other is, is implied generally. This is from 1895. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, there are only four stories in, that are actually in the Yellow King cycle. And then uh, Lovecraft uh, references them as sort of a throwaway reference, and he mentions them in his supernatural horror and literature. And then August Derleth then does much more of a job of roping uh, 
that stuff into the mythos. And so he, um, Pastor is just sort of cited as a place, uh, which is sort of ambiguous in uh, in Chambers. And then Durleth turns it into a Lovecraftian god who's sort of a, a, a weird slug being. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so uh, the, the Yellow King role-playing game ignores all of that stuff. There's no you know, slug, there's no other Lovecraftian entities. It's, um, and it uh, makes a point of making the Yellow King, although it never pins down his motives, it lets you, the GM, figure out exactly what he and his daughters are up to. He is a more satisfying villain because he's not indifferent to humanity. Uh, he's, uh, he's sometimes seeking to destroy and warp humanity, but he cares about it enough to be an accessible antagonist, whereas uh, a lot of the Lovecraftian gods, the whole point of them is that they're not even malicious, really. They're just horrible because they symbolize the indifference of a godless universe. And so they don't really want to destroy the world. Like, they're going to destroy the world, but that's just like, you know, the same reason that, you know, a virus uh, in infects your sinuses. That's, you know, it's nothing personal. Um, and so it's refreshing to get to, to work with a, a villain who is overtly antagonistic to mankind and has something uh, bad that they're trying to do in each of the, the four different uh, reality slash uh, time sequences that the game is set in. But do you find you have to sort of <clears throat> wrestle with those expectations because he's been so grafted to the kind of Lovecraftiana? You know, people have seen the big, like, you know, board games where the King in Yellow is, you know, you know, one of the factions. And, you know, there's just, it's it's been absorbed weirdly into this whole kind of mythos mess. Is it, has it been pretty easy to kind of like say, no, 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 this is its own thing. Or do you have to do a bait and switch and be like, hey, like Lovecraft, like King in Yellow? Well, here's what it actually is. Well, I've definitely, uh, we were able to get a lot of attention by doing some, by referring to something that people already know. But I think in general, people are kind of excited to see a new take on that. And so uh, uh, if it was only the four chamber stories and trying to do those, that would be uninteresting. But then there's a whole other mythology that I've woven around it uh, to uh, sort of catch people's interest. And uh, so far, I haven't heard anybody uh, complain. Um, and in fact, one of the uh, uh, Kickstarter rewards is there's a, a PDF that if you really, really want to sneak Cthulhu monsters back into it, you know, uh, who am I to <laughs> tell you, you can't? And so there, there are uh, game stats and shock and injury cards that correspond uh, to the various mythos entities if you if you really want to sneak them in because and you can justify doing that uh, because the whole idea is that the uh, Carcosa is infecting our world and actually warping realities and that people's perception of reality uh, is changed by reading the play the king in yellow or by encountering the seeing the yellow sign or encountering the, the king himself so it could very well be that uh, you know HP Lovecraft in this world, was a writer of fictional stories, but those stories can start to kind of tr become true as the world becomes more and more warped. So, what are the what are the different settings you sort of allow the players to to play in? Uh, so, the first one is Paris in 1895, the Belle Epoque. So, that's sort of classic historical role playing in an extremely fun era where there's a lot of stuff uh, going on, and uh, uh, there's uh, you know. You can have uh, Madame Curie interacting with Eric Satie, interacting with uh, 19th century occultists. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, 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 and that's sort of the most obviously sort of fun and, and upbeat and colorful uh, setting in which to completely lose your bearings and have your sense of reality ripped away from you. Uh, the next one is called The Wars. And this is set in the, in 1947, as the Continental War rages across Europe. So the idea is that the influence of the Yellow King starting in 1895 has sufficiently changed history that there's a completely different uh, uh, continent-spanning uh, war going on, and it's one in which there are uh, strange sort of walking tanks and uh, uh, weird dragonfly-like uh, helicopter attack vehicles, and uh, the uh, people don't overtly know that something supernatural is going on, but your soldiers, you play French soldiers fighting for the loyalist forces, and who exactly you're allied with and who you're fighting against is, if you've played the Paris section, sort of partly determined by that. And so this basically is a, a weird war horror setting. Uh, the next one is Aftermath, 
and that is in the present day in an alternate reality where the events of repair of reputations uh, were not only true instead of being a delusion, but in fact went the other way and the Castain regime has uh, ruled America for a century and you uh, as the uh, player characters took part in the revolution that unseated this totalitarian government. And so all of the gates to Carcosa have been closed, but there are still remnant elements and creatures and stuff in the, uh, in the margins uh, who uh, are either are trapped here or want to bring back the old supernatural totalitarian government. And so you are uh, A, deciding how to fit back into civilian life after uh, fighting in a revolution. And even though you're on the good side, maybe you went a little blood simple, we don't know. Um, and also uh, what society do, do you rebuild? It's been a hundred years of history has been diverted in the wrong direction. How do you recreate uh, society after uh, totalitarianism? And then there's creatures and, and things that are still out there that uh, you are uniquely qualified to put down. So it's uh, a mix of uh, politics and supernatural horror adventure. And then the final one is called This is Normal Now. You play the same characters that you played in Aftermath in what looks like our present day uh, in a world where uh, there's no uh, strange reality uh, uh, busting uh, uh, forces. There are no uh, memes out there that are changing the way people think. Uh, everything's fine. Everything's normal. There's nothing horrible uh, lurking on the other side of that corporate door or in that boardroom. And is sort of the uh, ideal way to kind of play through each segment kind of in, in turn, or is it really just kind of drop in and, and pick your, pick your the, flavor? The biggest, most ambitious way to do it, the way that I, I pitch it as the, the thing to aspire to do is to uh, run a campaign in each of the four uh, sequences. And the interesting thing about that is then that the uh, if an element uh, in, uh, from one of the earlier sequences then recurs, it has a big impact because it feels like a big callback and it's very exciting to see how they uh, sort of change and, and have different permutations over time. And you uh, are always connecting your new characters to the characters that went before them. And so uh, in, uh, for example, uh, in uh, uh, Aftermath, there, we had a, uh, I had a, uh, a brief bit where uh, we flashed back to the 1895 characters uh, just before the Great Chicago Fire. So you're used to them as young people, art students in Paris, and here they are, middle-aged in Chicago. And so there was like one episode where they went back to playing their old characters, and then the stuff they did in that episode then uh, filtered back and became the relevant backstory for the uh, for the next uh, regular aftermath scenario. So there's all sorts of fun things that you can do if you connect it up in that way. That does take a lot of time. Uh, my campaign was like a, a year and a third. Um, and so you can also just do what you typically do with a game, which is uh, dive in for uh, a quick scenario in one setting, or you uh, do, uh, you know, you might do uh, a couple of scenarios in each of the sequences, or, and I think the one that people will probably gravitate to like playing in one shots at conventions and stuff will mostly be the Paris one, uh, because it's the most, you know, outwardly fun and accessible. Oh, and uh, the convention adventures that I've uh, either written or run have been uh, set in Paris. But there's, uh, because there are four distinct flavors, uh, there's all, you know, whatever your, your weird fiction fancy, there's probably one of them that suits you. <clears throat> and so what's currently the, the release date or, or sort of the plan as far as uh, uh, this, uh, the King of the now. Make it folks see it. Yes. Uh, it's at the uh, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. It's at the printer now. We haven't announced a print date, but uh, should be should be soon. Finally, there's a uh, we learned uh, there's a bit of a hitch in the uh, printing. One thing about uh, working in role playing is you uh, learn a lot more about the print industry than you ever wanted. <laughs> and there, there are some new wrinkles as to uh, uh, why we uh, face some frustrating delays with this, but uh, it should get real soon. And this is not your also your first Kickstarter, I know, because I, I uh, took place with the the Hillful Kickstarter. You know, I think that was one of the first one of the first ones I, I I you know signed up for, 
has have you found that that has changed or at least sort of the relationship between gaming and Kickstarter has changed or is by this point is Kickstarter just kind of this default mechanism? Um, Kickstarter and tabletop role playing games uh, really occupy a sweet spot together so that it has become more and more sort of a core of what Kickstarter does that uh, the failure rate of tabletop campaigns is much lower than the failure rate of any other category. Uh, and some of the biggest successes are uh, in uh, uh, the tabletop scene. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, a tabletop product is something that can be relatively inexpensive to begin with, but then you can keep adding stuff to in order to make it more exciting as you go along. And certainly there have been some spectacular flameouts of people who have not done their homework or not made a business plan or promised too much um, in the tabletop space, because I can hear everybody furiously typing, what about uh, this or what about that? Um, but um, what you can do in role playing is you can say, well, we're going to go ahead and make this thing, uh, regardless of, of whether we get a giant ton of money or just a modest amount of money, we can do it on a small scale to begin with. So Hill Folk, for example, was originally conceived as a relatively thin, simple book, and it ballooned out into two very large books, um, not just because people were excited by it once they got to play it, because one of the things I always do with the Kickstarter is uh, always make sure that there's a playable draft version of the game that you get immediately as soon as you uh, pledge, because that excites, if you have something good and it's already done, um, that excites people and they want to get more on board with it. Um, and so a, a, a tabletop product is something that you can sort of uh, budget it to uh, fund right away and then create the excitement of what are we going to add to it with uh, stretch goals. Um, and obviously there are drawbacks with any approach and there are things that you don't want to be careful about uh, if you take that strategy. But it's certainly much easier to do than uh, with a lot of other product categories. For example, films. They're very, very expensive. You can't just say, well, if I get $5,000, I'm going to make this documentary. That's not enough. Or uh, uh, some items have fairly low uh, expected costs attached to them. So for example, doing iOS apps, people think, well, those are supposed to be three bucks. I'm not going to pay 50 bucks for a super deluxe version of it. Um, and so it's very hard for people to fund uh, that kind of product on, on Kickstarter. But there's just something about the combination of the expandability, uh, the price point, and the budget points of uh, tabletop games uh, that make them work really well in uh, the crowdfunding environment. Now, at this point, are you able to sort of game for fun, or are you essentially always kind of having to be playtesting and working through the next thing? Um, do you want the romantic answer or the truth? Uh, let's let's start with truth and see if we can, f if we can tease romance out of it. Uh, Role playing is not my hobby, it's my job. Um, and so uh, I run, uh, ideally, when I'm not sick and when I can get quorum, a role playing game every week, every Thursday night. But that game is uh, almost inevitably, unless I'm not working on a role playing project for a long period of time, is something that I uh, need to work on. So right now I'm running a RuneQuest campaign set in the Big Rubble because I'm writing the Big Rubble book. Before that, I spent a year and a half uh, doing the uh, uh, King Ye uh, Yellow game because somebody's got to be the biggest expert in the world of playing that game, and it should be the designer. Um, and so uh, I'm always learning new things about my own games as I continue to play them. Um, uh, people, I think, do kind of want to hear, oh, yeah, I, I play all kinds of games for fun, and I really love them. But uh, there's just on only so many hours in the week. and Inevitably, whatever I'm running is somehow going to be uh, filtering into uh, what I'm doing, but usually I'm running for a very specific uh, need. So, for example, the thing about the Big Rubble, I'm not really testing the rules or the stats per se, but I'm testing what decisions do the players make when put in this environment with this set of rules affecting their choices. Uh, speaking of the big rubble, we actually had a question before you mentioned it uh, from folks uh, from Arthur wanting to know when they're going to see Pavis and the big rubble. Um, it's it's going to be a big giant thing, uh, and um, I'm working on it uh, at the same time, or rather going back and forth between it and another big Glorantha project, the ch second chapter of Six Ages. Uh, and so we do, uh, we do not have a release date yet, 
but it's a big ambitious project that I'm uh, uh, not shirking on, I assure you, but we don't have a, <laughs> a, a release date yet. It'll, it'll be a little while. Fantastic. Uh, uh, another question we have, uh, someone wants to know what's some of the kind of the biggest or more interesting surprises to come out of these play tests? Um, I wouldn't say surprise per se, but just the, um, uh, again, the way that the uh, brutality and detail of the rules system uh, change people's choices. That this is these, uh, and so uh, one small example, and also just stuff that you don't think of as a, a role player. So this is not a. Um, so there's one island that's described as being covered in in briars and other thick, dried vegetation, and so naturally. The, the usefulness of having players actually encounter the environment is the first thing they say, well, we're going to set it on fire. <laughs> There's some actual stress <laughs> testing going on. Yes. And so it did not occur to me that they're going to set it on fire. But of course, they're going to set it on fire. That's what players do. And so uh, how to, exactly to set it on fire then became a big plot point that I will then have to go back and address in the text because uh, every every other group is also going to have that same thought right away. You can have, a, have just have a little like box text that's just like if it sets on fire, then. Uh, well, it's like uh, here are the hoops to make them jump through in order to get them to set up, set on fire because it's been there for hundreds of years uh, with other adventurers and looters, and no one has successfully set it on fire before. So you have to uh, not only account for what would happen if they set it on fire, but you have to explain why no one has done that yet when it's the obvious thing they think to do. Fantastic. So beyond us, so we got uh, Big Red <coughs> coming out. We got uh, King and Yellow coming out. What else can we look forward to? Um, those are my big projects for the for the next uh, foreseeable future. Are uh, King and Yellow. Uh, I'm uh, sort of uh, keeping a supervisory eye. On, oh, I can't. I don't think we've announced that. Nope, can't tell you about that one. Um, so uh, <laughs> Big Rebel Pavis and uh, Six Ages and uh, the Yellow King are. I have been my life for a big chunk of time and will continue to be my life uh, for uh, a lot of time to come. And uh, are there any uh, conventions uh, that you're also gearing up for at this time? Um, I will be at Gen Con, as is my won't, and I will also be at the Kraken uh, Gaming Retreat uh, in uh, uh, Berge, Germany in uh, October. Uh, that is a, a cool event that's held mostly in English uh, that focuses on uh, Chaosium, uh, Glorantha, Call of Cthulhu, uh, other Cthulhu things, and uh, is uh, in an old uh, sort of manor house that's been converted to a, uh, a hotel, uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere in uh, the former East Germany. And there's not even like a pizza place uh, within walking distance of the con, but uh, so all of the food is uh, is done for you as part of your uh, package that you purchase when you go to the Kraken. And uh, and of course, there's copious amounts of fine German beer there as well. So it's something, it's quite different spirit than what you might be used to uh, in a North American convention at a Holiday Inn, for example. Uh, but it has this great relaxed vibe and uh, everybody is sort of very deeply engaged in this one uh, corridor of gaming. I've been there uh, once before and I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, being there again. Great. And as we uh, begin to gear up uh, for uh, film season and uh, uh, the various uh, cinematic huts that uh, you occupy, uh, what should folks be looking forward to? What's, uh, something, what's a good uh, movie out there that folks might have overlooked? Uh, go see High Life by Claire Denis. Uh, this is a, a creepy uh, science fiction uh, movie with strong sort of uh, horror overtones, but also uh, very emotional. It's, uh, she's a a French director, one of the great directors of the world right now, uh, who's had a long and storied career. She's other films she's done include uh, uh, Chocolat, not the uh, the Juliette Monash one, but an earlier one, uh, Beau Travail, um, and this one is her first English language film. It has uh, Robert Pattinson in it. Um, he's really great, and uh, it sort of starts out about he and uh, he's alone on a spaceship with a uh, an infant and is uh, trying uh, to protect this. A, a child and, and keep it alive. Uh, and then you see through flashbacks the a series of events that led to this. And basically, uh, he was one of a number of uh, uh, prisoners, a sort of a suicide squad, as it were, who were uh, sent into space in order to perform space exploration. And guess what? Things went horribly wrong. But it's a, 
really evocative and atmospheric and and chilling and has some really unforgettable images. And so if you want to see a very distinct sort of art house take on uh, the uh, on hard science fiction, uh, uh, check that out. And that has uh, Juliette Binoche in it as, as well as uh, uh, some other familiar faces. So I would highly recommend High Life. High life. All right. Excellent. Everyone uh, can go uh, check that out. Well, um, I want to take a quick moment, a quick uh, ad break, uh, because uh, folks uh, at home will know uh, that we are uh, giving away these <coughs> fantastic pens. And given, uh, I think, uh, your particular uh, place of honor, I think we're today, this week, we're going to give away the yellow sign pen. This is, of course, from our good friends at Arkham Bazaar and, of course, uh, the folks who made uh, the Cthulhu Con, where Robin and I met. So if folks uh, want to uh, win an opportunity to get uh, the yellow sign, then all you need to do is email asklovecraft at gmail.com with the subject line Robin D. Laws. And uh, in the body of the text, uh, why don't you uh, tell me what manner of cinema you would adapt for a role-playing game. I know I'm still waiting for my Nollywood game. So at some point, when I make my millions, I will come to you, Robin. Uh, and cut you a check so that you can give us the the, the finest Nollywood role playing game that well, uh, uh, the so world deserves. Of course, Nollywood is all about soap opera, so you can play that with Hill Folk. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, I, I will I will sate myself with Hill Folk. But everyone else out there, do your homework. Send that in. Uh, this, of course, for the moment uh, is uh, limited to those of us in the continental United States. Uh, and uh, yeah, so get that into us uh, by Friday, and I will pick a winner and uh, mail you one of these delightful pens. Uh, Robin, where can folks find you online if you wish to be found? Uh, probably just start with my Twitter, which is at Robin D. Laws. Or go to, yeah. uh, uh, I have a weekly podcast with Ken and Hype, which we alluded to earlier, called Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff. Uh, you can find that at kenandrobintalkaboutstuff.com, or just type in Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff into the search bar of your podcast app of choice. That is a fantastic show. Uh, I do not recommend it, though, for people who cannot game, like when I was sort of in the midst of, you know, taking care of two small children and, and had no time for gaming in my life, it was painful because all I was, I was being inspired. I was like, oh, I want to do this. Oh, now I want to do this. Oh, now they're talking about aquatic adventures. And obviously I need to learn how 18th century boats work. So it's also very fun if you have a medievalist uh, riding along in the car who starts shouting at Ken. Uh, that is a lot of fun. <laughs> well, as long as Ken is being shouted at, that's fine by me. <laughs> Well, thank you, Robin, so much for coming on the show. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have you again uh, to talk about other secret projects once they're announced and uh, find out just how uh, the uh, King in Yellow is received by the world at large. Uh, uh, if folks awesome. have enjoyed thank this show, <laughs> if folks have enjoyed this, this is Ask Lovecraft After Dark. We're the sister program to Ask Lovecraft, my three times a week program, where for reasons that uh, don't merit going into, I pretend to be H.P. Lovecraft and answer people's questions. Uh, you can uh, find out uh, more about that at asklovecraft.com. You can follow that show at Ask Lovecraft on Twitter. Or if you just want to see me screaming into the void, you can follow me at Twitter at Lehman Kessler. Uh, if you would like to be part of this live conversation, uh, ask questions to our guests, uh, you can go over to Facebook and join the Ask Lovecraft Appreciation Society. And if you want to know more about live dates or whatever else I'm getting up to, you can go to lehmankessler.com. Once again, Robin, it's been an absolute treat having you on the show. Hope you're having a wonderful time in my old home of Toronto. It was a delight. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day.